hello and welcome to another episode of Relative Pitch. What's been going on? I feel like my brain's like really foggy. It's it's been a whirlwind of the year. I'm gonna go ahead and say it. This year has been long. This year has been long. Um, and we're only in the second month. Uh, but I feel like I have yet to like calm down. And honestly, it could be because uh, the University of Georgia is hosting the College Band Director National Association National Conference, which will be happening uh, this week when this, al- when not this album, oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like going to what we're talking about. But anyway, um, when this episode drops, will be the first day of the CBDNA conference, uh, which we are so excited about this year, particularly because we are presenting at that conference. So it's going to be like super duper good. Um, Along with, I'm also, since I go to UGA, um, the Win Ensemble is performing, which is going to be fantastic. Um, The rep that the Win Ensemble is doing is great. But one thing that I've noticed about this experience and being in behind the scenes, I am worked crazy. Like no one ever talks about when conferences happen, how much like logistics things is behind the scenes. I'm so tired. I don't even want to even put the letter C, B, D, and A together. I really don't. I really don't. But I'm going to err on the good side, and I think it's going to be great. And we have some great guests Do. that will be joining us, people that have uh, our Relative Pitch fam, uh, including Dr. Emily Ang, Dr. Shari Williams, and Leah Sneed, uh, which have all been members of Relative Pitch. Uh, so we're just so glad that they are joining us Um, and sharing their changing of the guard, their perspectives of education. Um, So I think it's going to be great. Are y'all excited for it? Yes. Yes. Um, I'm going to need you to retry that and give me an ounce more of enthusiasm. Thank you. Yes. You know what? I heard it. So I I appreciate it. Well, see, okay. So y'all think the year's been going by. It's been long. I think we snapped and it's already February 12th. Like, I feel like it's been, whoosh, but just as busy as ever, but whoosh, going by fast as I'll get out because yeah. like I'm having to reschedule so much stuff to do things like GMEA, to do things like CBDNA, to look in the future and be like, why do kids not go to school anymore? Like you just got off a winter break. You do not need another winter break. Like the conversation for a whole nother day. I know, but it's just like pl- throwing a big ranch in plants. It's like, oh, that was like, okay, some of my jobs are on winter break. Okay, let me contact the other schools to do recruiting. They're also on winter break. Okay, so all these kids are going to be out. I'm not leaving my house. I do not want to see these children. And don't. Right. I was like, and why would you? Right. And don't. Children, love kids, but sometimes we, they, can, we, they just be out doing things they ain't supposed to. But anyways. Like yes. Like you wasn't, and like you wasn't. I don't know what you're not gonna do is okay, okay, in the month of black history, right? First of all, the month of black history, would you ever do that? Uh -uh. Michael, we should have replaced you for the month anyway. If we would have (laughs) been really to the back. Oh, no, we need our own eyes. I'm calling, I'm calling in my uh, sub right now. I'm sorry. I forgot. I didn't get the memo that we I was like, subbing out. This month. We need our allies. We need our allies. Mm. But no, actually, that's actually interesting. I wanted to talk about that. I don't feel like Black History Month is Black History Monthing like it usually does. And I want to know why that is. Yeah. I don't know when I was when we were in school, mm-hmm. like I don't know, like middle school, high school. I mean, even high school, it felt like there was always something in the month of February. But like, I walked into one of my schools and I was like, "Oh, there's a periodic table." That's it. They put they put a periodic table of famous, uh, um, like artists, uh, writers, playings like that. And but then I'm like, I'm on there, and you know me. 
I'm on there and I'm like, okay, this is cool. But out of all the music stuff, like, you know, we have like the band choir and stuff. They didn't like even try to fight for a little position of people that weren't just pop artists just to be put on there. Like you can, you can put one, like you can hide one amongst all the pop stars and they won't cause a riot. Now, if you put all 20 of them as classical composers, which would, then people might start a riot because they're like, where's Michael Jackson? Where's Nicki Minaj? Where's Solange? And like, that's like who's on there. And I was like, maybe I could have fought for like two or three to be on there or like, I don't know. That was just me. I watched. I was like, oh, that's nice. And bet her nothing else. And there's no other signs, no other posters. So I was like, yeah, if I, to confirm you, Lauren, that's why I said that. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. It's just, I was thinking about it because this month really, I mean, I, my month kind of started off with wild because I had the recital and all this other stuff. And this week has just been crazy with work and then this or now this up upcoming week is cbdna and so it's felt like everything has just been like boom 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 but still i haven't really like found that there were any moments or anything like i haven't been seeing as big of a of a um awareness of that it is black history month um and it kind of affirms a lot of what we talked about near the beginning as we wonder if all this is going to stay around because we we talked about this huge boom of everyone wanting to celebrate different cultures and da 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 and we were like well how long is it going to last you know and it seems like maybe it's not profitable for people anymore they think it's not profitable because like there are a lot of i don't see really many symphonies or anything doing black history month celebrations or anything like that or i just don't see it i don't know um and i don't know maybe like some people are Some people are doing things, but you know, because I mean, even here on the podcast, we've said that we feel that some people just do things so that their name is associated. So like I did this for Black History Month. I think some people are doing things for Black History Month, but they're not saying it's for Black History Month. Mm -hmm. um, like I, we went to the ASO um, and at the end of the month, they're doing William Grant Steele Negro Folk Symphony. And it's not you know, it's not marketed as Black History Month. Uh, it is marketed. Conrad, Conrad Tayo. Yeah, the which, and, and by, I want to say like a Black um, conductor, like it's, but it's, it's not Black history, which, you know, can be good because it's like, mm, you're not using the name, but it's still in February, you know, and one day before favorite, like, you know, so. I... Well, you know what, but we, we do talk about how it's weird when organizations just do Black History Month celebrations. So it, it I would feel OK with it if I felt as, as if there was a huge boom of uh, Black composers being used throughout the year. Mm -hmm. But. I don't know if I can say that that is happening. So that's why I'm a little hesitant to go, well, that's a good thing that it's not just in Black History Month because I'm, where where is it? If, if it's not there, then when are you actually right. uh, programming that music? Because I don't see it. That's and what brings me to uh, uh, kind of a question on that is when... Pe when these organizations are planning for, for you know, the whole season or whatever, I, I'm pretty sure they plan this way, like horizontally, rather than, okay, I want this concert to be this, this. And if you only program Black music during February, again, that's a problem. Because that's yes. tokenism. That is that is tokenism. <laughs> like, if you are only putting it that month, that is tokenism. Yes, because you're sharing, you're sharing light, but you're not sharing power. Because what? if you were really doing it, you would absolutely sprinkle that through. Well, it's mainly it's just separated. It's it's literally separate but equal. It's the same. It's the exact same thing of oh, you can use it. We will do it, but only in its time. But mm -hmm. then when it comes to a random, you know, Thursday concert in March, why not there? Right. Why not there? 
you know? And the whole thing is like, it's not, it's not to say that there should not be cultural celebrations in the, the heritage months, because there should be. We are saying it should not just be there though. Yes, right. But in general, I just don't feel like I'm seeing much at all, like honestly this year. And it's not the same. I've had other, other um, people here who have been like, I don't really feel like I see a lot of Black History Month celebrations happening this year. And it's weird. You know, in Athens, Alvin Ailey's company was here um, and they did Appalachian Spring. Mm. Was it Alvin Ailey? I think it was Alvin Ailey uh, Dance Company and yeah. they did uh, Appalachian Spring. And I'm like, oh, yeah, like Alvin Ailey, fantastic dance company, black, you know, great. But could you also use that moment to showcase a black artist, you know, a, a, a you know, music of that. Like, I don't know what behind the scenes, and I'm not saying, you know, I'm not coming after y'all. I'm just saying that, but I don't know. It, it is, it feels like it's just February and not this month where we're supposed to be celebrating Black, especially in this, this era that we're in right now. Mm. I would say it feels like like last year and especially 2021 and 2020, it was deep. And I think it was fresh. You know, a lot of things were happening in those years. So I don't know if now the dust is settling. So now it's like, well, so what are we supposed to do now? Are we angry? Are we content? Are we sad? Are we, you know, what what's going on? It's weird because I feel like there's such a, I don't even know if it's a double-edged sword. I feel like it's like a sword that has like seven different spikes on it when you talk about celebrating Heritage Months. Because then it's the whole thing of exactly what we always talk about. We don't just want it to be during that month. So then people are now, our organizations, now they're scared because they're like, oh gosh, well, we are we, we don't want to plan it. But then when are you planning it? When right. are you planning on uh, highlighting this type of artists or artists from this community and da da da, and then I also feel like on the other side of that, there has been a movement within the Black community and also in other POC communities where there are some uh, people who identify as POC and Black don't identify as ex actor or ex artist or ex musician because Ooh. it's like they want. It's well, there's a lot of different, but here, hear me yes. out. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I, hold on. I, told, hold Anthony, on. I told you she said it. <laughs> Anthony, I told you. I told you. The first, oh. I will say this because there was an article. I want to say it was a, a Jesse Montgomery, um, an article on Jesse Montgomery talking to this in the sense of wanting or just uh, this idea of being seen as an artist, period. And there's all, I think Idris Elba also um, spoke mm -hmm. to this as well about wanting to be just seen as an, as an actor, not a black actor. But the this other side to that type of mindset is you are black though. Facts. And so it's not, it's this idea of like, well, they should see me as that. And they're like, yeah, in a perfect world, that is the case. But unfortunately, everyone has eyes. Most people have eyes. Most people have the sight to see. And especially for a field such as music where, or an art in general, where we put so much of ourselves into what we do, it goes, it comes with it. It's a part of it. It's not like something you can kind of just take away and be like, oh, I'm just this. Because guess what? There's typecasting or that when people want to program certain music by certain communities, they look for people, guess what? In those communities. So you can't really say... You don't want to be seen as it, but when it benefits you, then it's okay. Is my that's how I feel about it. And also on that, it's like, um, in the the society that we live in, the majority will always be the norm. Mm -hmm. So it is norm to be a white actor. That's why it's just actor. That's why we have black actors. Mm -hmm. And I, I think Nia Long also spoke to this as well about how I she felt that what is holding uh, holding black actors back is like black Hollywood, you know, mm -hmm. movies that are truly in the black culture that doesn't cross over. And my rebuttal to that, and this is the same thing for black music. I'm okay with that. Mm -hmm. 
I truly am because it's something about our culture that yes, it is for us. It's by us. It is for our consumption, which, you know, is it the most probably profitable thing? See, that's the real thing. Mm -hmm. A lot of these actors and musicians that say, I want to be this, they're thinking maybe from a profitable standpoint, because Mm -hmm. we all know if you're a crossover act, there's more coins in your Mm -hmm. purse. And I'm all about getting your money. Please get your money. But there's something about, you know, being for that culture, Uh, like the movies and the music that I grew up with. I know that that is specific to black community. And I know that like that is really like, uh uh-huh, this is for us. This is by us. Like Nia Long, she's a black Hollywood actor. I love her. Like Big Mama House. I mean, it's a crossover, but it, it that first one is definitely Black Hollywood. And, yes. um, you know, she's been in other Black Hollywood movies. And I'm like, yeah, because it's for us, right. it's by us. But on that, I saw this on Twitter and it was like, these are two type of Black people. So you have uh, Idris Elba says he no longer refers to himself as a Black actor because the label puts him in a box and an obsession with race can hinder aspirations for growth. This is the other. This is John Boyega. Um, He said, I think we should fixate on who is typecasting and putting actors in boxes because of this, not on making weird adjustments for them. We continuously focus on what we have to do so they don't uh, do this or that. Very worrying. We bl- we are Black, and that's just that. See, well, he, John Boyer wrapped it up perfectly because he, he highlighted the fact that Idris Elba, with what he was trying to say, still was making he was doing something fixing something about himself changing something about himself changing whatever that he does in order to fit the mold of what hollywood or whatever is looking for versus actually saying no it's the structures and the systems that confine certain actors who happen to be black or other people of color into certain boxes that other like white actors or whatever do not get put in so right. john Boyega goes like uh uh-uh, we ain't changing the fact that we're black but we can call out the systems that put us in these box yeah and you're right there's it's one or the other yep. there, i've met both i've met both types right and same here i've met both types one thing about me i'm always going to be a black teacher I'm going to be a Black conductor, a Black musician. And I take pride in that as well. I take pride in being a Black musician because I don't want the title erased because I see me being a Black musician as something as, I'm, I'm damn well proud of that. And you should see that as well. Mm-hmm. You know, just like uh, I'm a gay musician, you know, people, it's funny. It's it's because I've seen this so much. I feel like black people because we are told so much that we need to assimilate that we should leave our blackness behind. But then when the majority say, well, I'm this pronoun actor or this, they're like, yes, yes, you are. You are that. Well, when I say I'm black, this why is that bad? Because and and that has really been the argument is I see you know applause and re- and such high regard when the majority say, well, I am this kind of actor. I'm this. Mm-hmm. That's all I'm saying. I'm a black musician. I'm a black conductor. I'm a black mm-hmm. educator, and I'm damn well proud of that. As you should be. And as everybody should be. Because, like, as we've talked about multiple times, like, when you see an Anthony conducting on a stage, there's going to be someone sitting in the audience. And they're going to be like, that's possible. Or when you see Lauren sitting on an e-board somewhere, maybe, soon, they, and they'll be like, wow, they're doing, like, a research project. And they're like, she's sitting on an e-board. That's possible. That is that can that can be my future. I see somebody that is my future, and it's just like the visibility thing. And it's also just like I don't know. This is because like 
I don't really pay em, um, enough attention to like actors and stuff. Like I watch the movies and stuff, but like, I guess I I've seen the whole, or the, who is the composer you brought up Lauren? Which, um, Oh, Jesse Montgomery. That happened when we were driving to GMEA last year. I remember that vividly. Cause me and Anthony were talking about it. We just couldn't remember the composer's name, yeah. <laughs> but like that happened on the way to driving to GMEA. And we talked about it for hours. Cause we were coming from Orlando. It was a very long trip. So I, I don't get it though. I'm like, you like you have the chance to inspire people. You have the chance to be the next inspiration. Now, I'm not saying it's your job mm-hmm. or it's your, you have to do it, but you have the chance. You already got the job. You already did this. You're already there. Yeah. I don't think like I don't know if like in this you Anthony and Lauren, you can answer this, but adding that blank composer, blank actor. If you're already there, you're already in the rooms. Is it going to take you out of the rooms? I don't know. That's why I'm asking. No, but actually, let's let's take it even a step back from this and talk about why. Like, let's be scientific about it. Like, we have developed habits over time that has been passed through generations and generations and generations and survival tactics. A lot of the the things, instincts we have have been generated from this feeling of survival. Everything that we feel instinctual is survival. Like there's, we get fear, all these things because our bodies and brains have been built and uh, what is it? Rev- like uh, through evolution um, has been created to make us at the strongest possible beings of the now, right? So I feel like we have to think about our generations before us who what they had to deal with and things they had to overcome and why that can still be seen now because i'm sure back in the day when actors actresses all these artists black artists were just trying to get their name out and just trying to work in the field it was hard to like show yourself and be like i'm a proud black actor i'm a proud proud like this not saying that they didn't because a lot of them did do that but i'm sure there was a lot of push from their end, from whether they're whoever was managing them or even the people who wanted to hire them. But they're like, we just don't want you to market yourself as a black this, right? Um, because then it adds a layer of personality to it. And we talked a lot about how a lot of the entertainment industry and black people being within the entertainment industry was literally just for entertainment sake without any connection to possibly like the roots and heritage and other, other things that happen. So I kind of under I I feel like it's left over instinctual things from the past that causes current day like black actors, artists, musicians to go. I don't want to be categorized as this in the fear of lo- losing out on certain opportunities and da da da. I I understand. It's like I understand why because you you we understand the system. Some people you will find producers whatever who don't want to typecast someone who is exuding like I am black power I want to do this and da 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 they just want someone who you happen to be black and you could fit this role some people see that that's fine and I'm on the side of it feels like they're erasing a part of you it feels like they're trying to hide a specific part of you and it's like why I think there was a whole thing about female conductors saying I don't want to be called a female conductor I want to be just called a conductor this there was a whole movement with actress actor not wanting to use actress and I'm like where is it going to stop like at what point like are we just all going to start being one being like you know every, everyone is exactly the same and there's nothing special about any one in particular but everyone's just I don't think that's the point of all of all of this I really don't. So also going back to something that you were talking about, um, being black is, is, you know, pushed on you reminds me of the documentary about the Meghan Markle situation. And she Mm. said that her first time that she realized she was a black woman was when she married Prince Harry. Mm. Mind Listen. you, she was 30 something years old. Oh, was it because of all the publicity? Well, uh, she was an actress before then, right? She was, right. In a, she she was, was an actress. She was yeah. ethnically yeah. ambiguous. Mm-hmm. Ethnically ambiguous. She it's grew up in, in more white spaces. And she, and, and, and the olden days, some would have maybe classified her as passing. 
mm-hmm. as a passing black person. And we also got a black history. We got to talk about how those your lighter complexion people that were able to pass, they wanted to. They would absolutely squash their blackness to pass. But it was also and that's n- nothing wrong with them at that time because that was a survival method. Right. Exactly. So to today with Megan, she went her entire life not really comprehending her blackness until she married a white man in a, a predominantly, truly predominantly white area, England, which we all know what it looks like. Yeah. And that and it wasn't until she got called the N-word then she got all these, you know, uh, slurs. And that, and to me, that was actually, it was funny to me because I'm like, you know, everybody was, was saying this about Megan and, uh, and all that about she's black, da, 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 da. And then she comes in and she says, I didn't realize I was black until two, three years ago. It's a wild statement, first of all. That is, that is a wild. That wild. is a wild statement. Like That's, me just sitting right here, I'm just like, that is is wild. But wow. I can I can see like, as you said, she was the um, ambiguous actor. Yeah. Yeah. I can see depending on where you get tight, where you get uh, casted, mm-hmm. or even at times sometimes typecasted. But the minute you are put in front of like like the search cavity, like. They are searching for everything about you if you're near the royal family that everything will come out mm-hmm. and that it could be a big shock. Um, but is that is a wild statement to have been. I completely forget this time in history, apparently. I was not reading. It's no, it's so interesting though, because there's so many conversations on like being biracial and all this. Uh, right. it's always, it's always something pieces on Twitter about it. Listen, at the end of the day, when you are like, I always put it to the parents. I always look at the parents and go, okay, I start there, just there. I start there, especially if they're young children. And I go, okay, well, what did your parents teach you about your heritage? And sometimes, unfortunately, what happens is, especially if the parents are separated and the child goes to one parent over the other and it's been, then it's obvious that naturally I would expect them to start just showing the mannerisms of the parent that they are around. Now, here's the other thing though. If the parent who they're around doesn't necessarily want their kid to identify as a part of that culture, which we see that as well, then what happens is this child can grow up with this false idea of identity, of being like, oh, I'm not this ex. I'm not this. My mom is, but I'm not this. My dad is, but I'm not this. Yep. And especially if they're Which, putting ooh. in the spaces. Ooh, the girl say it. Um, the former candidate for uh, Georgia, um, Herschel Walker and his son. Girl. Oh, is that, was that a... Oh yes, oh yes. You did you you not you didn't know that that I saw. Oh my gosh! I just I knew like okay. So the only thing I knew about this was first of all, anyone can run for governor now or a senate, and second was that his son was gay. Yeah, but but I want you. It's like so. Do you know who Candace Owens is? Yes. I've heard. I have learned that name from y'all too. I, I I every time I hear Candace, I'm like. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> well, I, I, but so, and for anybody that's watching a, a, a old school movie, and it has some of the best music in it by the great Mahalia Jackson, famous gospel singer. Um, she, it's a movie called Imitation of Life. Mm. And it mm-hmm. was originally made in the 50s. And, um, Basically, the story is about a, a, a it's a, a black girl that mm-hmm. she's very light skinned mm-hmm. and she grows up and she actually does the whole I'm passing and she grows her whole life. She, in fact, kind of renounced her own mother, like her mother showed up to the all white school, which she was going to. And her mother like came to do this. And, and the mom was like, I'm here to uh, give my child their lunch. And the teacher's like, 
who is your child? There is no black child in here. Crazy. Um, and like, and to, and it, the hatred, I'm just going to say hatred was all the way until that mother died. The mother, the funeral. And that's where Mahalia Jackson sings beautifully at the funeral. And, and the, the daughter comes in crying and, and you see her so distraught, but that tells you the story about the whole, you know, passing and the story of that. That is crazy. Mm -hmm. This is not a part of my culture. And this is wild. It's it, it's just insane because that's honestly, especially in the South, child, like we, well, it's just crazy because people would think there's probably not a lot of biracial people in the South. There's a crap ton of biracial people in the South. There's a lot of them. That is a general population of the South <laughs> in itself. General in population. Itself. But like the whole thing, I mean, it really just goes back to like how how these how people were raised, what their what communities were they in, what communities were they exposed to, what culture they were exposed to, and I I understand the idea of because I remember I think at some point we talked maybe even talked about Jesse Montgomery in that article on the podcast about yeah. how it is understandable in a sense that maybe she doesn't want she's saying it's not my job to to da 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 and there are other people who said this as well it's not my yep. job to be the spokesperson yep. for black composers black female composers da 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 and um there is i'm gonna i'm just going to say this because it's, it's the truth there is a responsibility that comes when you get a certain platform right when you raise yourself right. to a certain level and you get to a, you a, you um you gain these opportunities where you're able to speak and people will listen and like all these different things. I, it is a responsibility. Mm -hmm. And whether or not you want to use or uphold yourself to those standards of responsibility, that's a choice. It is always a choice whether or not you want to do as we see now with other actors, as we we're talking about Idris Elba, not wanting to necessarily say, I am a black actor. That is a choice, but there's also the other choice of being like, no, we have the opportunity to call out these systems and structures and to use our platform and our voice. Now understand that that comes with the risk of certain people not wanting to work with you. Yes. You just have to decide what you value, what you stand for and what actually matters to you. You know what I mean? And that is your choice to make. And it is up to you to find which one is right and which one is wrong. Some people can truly differentiate between the two. I mean, I have my own opinions uh, on that, but again, those are just my opinions. You right. could do whatever the hell you want to do, you know? But for me, if I'm a Black person, I know that I am also representing Black people. Mm. That's, I, that's just who I am as a person. But I know that, yeah. you know, person, other person of color might not, you know, want to. That's their prerogative. No one said you had right. to. Um, this reminds me of the time, like, okay, me. Yeah. The, learning a lot, by the way, tonight. And I love that for myself. Um, Like that movie, like I kind of want to go watch it but i'm also scared to watch it because i feel like it's really just like crazy but like i work in a region would you say i was like it's a it's a very eye-opening uh movie i bet it is i know it is um i work in a region my university's in a region where it's not it's very good country sometimes and it's in the hills and the mountains and I, because of who I am, I had my pronouns in my email signature. I remember going to one of these band things and I was like, I just sent an email from my signature. It's my signature. And the first thing they were like, well, it's nice to meet you. And you look normal. What is this whole pronoun bullshit about? Mm. So, mm. Michael in undergrad might have removed those from my email signature. Michael, today I said that is a sign to let everybody know that I love them and I welcome them and that I will respect any boundary they put in front of me. 
said, I will go work with your trumpets now. Bye. Mm-hmm. 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 Gross. You have to know you have to know where you are and which part of your life. Michael in undergrad would see money and see money leaving. Michael now, girl, I got money. Girl, I got contacts. And also, I just you gotta accept who like for like from my community. You gotta accept who you are on the outside, on the inside, and in the profession. Because if you're hiding a little bit of yourself, you're hiding more than that in every area of your life. That's just my community. I cannot even imagine what my co-host Lauren and Anthony go through. Because if I just don't talk and I shave my head and I wear my straight men things, I could be passing. Yeah, easily. More than, Michael, all you got to do is honestly just show up. Don't say anything. Just don't well, say this is Y'all re would remember, or y'all should remember, in undergrad, me and Michael got mistaken as a couple all the time. All the like, time. All the time. Until he opened that mouth. <laughs> until <laughs> I opened my mouth. Ah, bitch clocks. Ooh. <laughs> or the, or the, or no, because two of the North Pauline people have clocked me. Remember oh, at Midwest, they clocked me, they clocked me from my voice. But or walk me watch walk away because I'd be walking weird sometimes. Mm. It depends on the day. Sometimes you walk like a 40-year-old divorced dad. Wow. With the young Anyways, daughter. We're not gonna do this. Um, <laughs> but I remember Anthony and Lauren on this podcast in the first season was like, I can't watch it. It's me. And I was just like, I never like I've like known that, but like until you like say it and put it out there, you're like, wow, like me in my community. I remove those pronouns. I dress like I did today with a athletic polo. You would never know. That's what's crazy is because I'm like, I, I gener I can't, what, what am I supposed to do? What do you mean? I'm I, like, I don't identify as this. It doesn't matter what I say or what I think in my head, people are going to see me and immediately assume from their own knowledge, their own backgrounds. And, and sometimes these assumptions are not bad, but in the wrong situations, if you're trying to be like, oh, I'm not trying to be identified as da da da, it doesn't matter. If they want to see you as that, they're going to see you as that. So why not instead learn to love yourself, learn to understand that being who you are is every little part of you is a part of who you are and it makes you unique. It makes you special and lean into it. Hold on. Just unique. Ooh. Okay. Let's talk unique? about it. Let's no. talk about it. I'm so glad you say unique. Uh, uh, this topic about the queen hairs of which I got my ticket secured and I got, I just got the little, the, the tall tip and more tickets. But anyway, that's beyond the point. So, you know, there's been some uproar about, um, oh, first, shout out to Jack Eady for being nominated for the Grammy Music Teacher of the Year. Shout um, out. Was, shout out. Has been part of the Votes to Pitch Committee. Uh, congratulations on your nomination. And also, congratulations to Kelvin. As well, he actually won a Grammy um, with his. Wait, wrong, am I lying? I might be lying. He was nominated. I think as well. you're talking about. He was nominated, but I think um, at um, Flute Bay, Ashley Crawford, Flute Bay, actually, Tennessee is State, now. Tennessee State, they okay. won their category. Um, so we had a lot of Rose to Pitch people. Uh, out there. Also, mm -hmm. I saw Marie Douglas. She was out there stunned in the Grammy street. <laughs> so, you know, the Grammys yeah. were full, but it was big and popping with the whole album of the year controversy. Mm. Mm. See, mm. before we get into this, I just want to say I didn't want it to happen, but I knew it was going to happen. Oh, I knew it was going to happen. That's why I turned it off. I turned it off. I, I, I for four years in a row, or not four years in a row, but four times, Beyonce is always up for album of the year. And this is coming from a day one beehive, okay? I have been Beyonce fan since Destiny's Child, since DC4 in 1997 with No, 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 part one and part two featuring Wyclef John, okay? Been a fan. And ever since then. I knew they were not going to give Beyonce that award. And I think it's a double-edged sword of why. So, 
just based on history with the Grammys and mm-hmm. the Recording Academy for Album of the Year, when they look at Album of the Year, they go by how many people are writing and producing the songs. Okay? Mm. The less, the more likely you are going to win Album of the Year. That's usually why a lot of the Album of the Year that you see are sometimes your not most well-known albums. Because your most well-known albums, which are big artists, are, you know, there's many producers and there's many writers because they're trying to make a great product. And in this case, uh, one thing for Beyonce is her album is full of samples and, and, you know, she loves collaborating with people, which is a great thing. And one thing I love about Beyonce is she's going to give you your credit as well. She is going to give credit where credit is due. If she uh, samples something, guess what? You have writing credits. Like, shout out to T.S. Madison. T.S. Madison has a little um, interpolation um, in one of the songs. She T.S. Madison is credited as a writer on that album, which gives T.S. Madison now more play, more credit to her name, more money. Her bag is there. And this is for a lifetime. This is lifetime generational wealth that anytime that song is played, guess what? T.S. Madison is getting cut a check. Right. As also, they uh, uh, Tina Marie, which is a fantastic R.B. singer, uh, life taken too soon, too soon. Um, uh, Beyonce used a sample of hers. And actually, the sample or the song that she used actually won a Grammy. And this was Tina Marie's first Grammy because she was credited as a writer. Her daughter released uh, a statement saying, wow, my mother is finally getting her just due now. And I think Tina has been dead for 13 years now. She's finally got her. So now we can discuss about album of the year. Because what what is the definition of album of the year? Is it truly the album that changed most people's life? Because then it is Renaissance. Right. When it dropped, it is. Everybody, every everything shook. Oh, everything you, shook. You know every Pride weekend that existed. She knew. She, when that's all that was playing. She, she knew, and she knew. and she and like in this time compared to, I believe. Correct me if I'm wrong, Anthony, our resident Beyonce person. In Lemonade, she did not give credit to one of the samples. Well, and which she she did, um, and that was to Messy Maya, and which that was a a controversy as well because uh, it was taken from YouTube. So the question is, who do you give? Who do you you flame? But also, did you? Oh, well, what? It's funny because she learned from that because the T.S. Madison part is also from yeah. YouTube. So she, uh, okay. she was a learning artist. Well, and that's what I'm saying. Her evolution as just making sure everybody who contributed on this album, everybody I that w- went into my artwork to the world got paid. Like, that's something like I liked as she even a. Took some people I, off. Who is that? She even took. Some people, because when she released the album, there was an artist who was complaining that did, they didn't let uh, them know that they were using a sample when uh, receipts are receipts. They let the right. person who wrote that song know. And if that Good. artist would have just said, uh, let me just get my no. money and let me shut up, that per- right. that artist still would have been getting money. But guess what? You want to play with me? Beyonce said, "Well, let me take this sample away, period, and I will period. re-release the song." And that's exactly what she did. Period. But like, that's what that for me as a fan of Beyonce, but also just like learning more about the industry. I was like, I appreciated that for Beyonce with Renaissance. I was like, she really did her homework. That like that got mistaken for in Lemonade. She said, I'm going to make sure everybody I use will get money for it. And that's also- a double-edged sword. And that's why 
I knew that yep. she was going to win album of the year because the recording Academy wants to see that you and one other person sat down at a piano or sat down in the studio and wrote all 16 tracks by yourself. And I think that maybe was fine in 1986. I think that needs to be a separate category now. Right. No, I no, think no, no, that no. should be songwriter. No, no. Like, cause they have songwriter of the year over there. I don't, I, this is my issue though. Is this getting too much into the, Oh, it's because we want da, da, da. What does album of the year mean? Exactly. You cannot claim that just because Beyonce used samples and credited it to these artists. And it's a reason as to why it's not like she just pulled samples because she didn't want to write. There is reason as to why she, why she and also other artists use samples. What? No, I don't. I don't buy it. I don't buy the fa the whole thing of oh, it's because they had less of this, less of this. Renaissance, it, it shook everything. It did. I went to a club just to go to a listening party. All and just, the, all they did was play all of Renaissance and then play some other Beyonce stuff at the end, and that was the night. Right. The it, the impact that it has had on everything. Let me tell you, I'll say this, Harry's House, because we know who won was Harry Styles with Harry's House, which was his second studio album. Um, I know this because I have been a fan and I follow Harry as well because I like some of the things he does. Here's the thing, though, about why I, I listen to both of them. I know both of these artists. I knew Harry when he first started because I wasn't a One Directioner. I feel like I was One Directioner adjacent because friends were Directioners. I myself was not. I would have said I was more of a Zayn stan because that baby, the album, huh? I can still listen to it. He was just that, fine. that is something. He's just fine. That's that's another thing. That's Harry's another house. Thing. Harry has has learned, and his team has learned how to market him as this a, a very Elton John style icon artist that a lot of that type of people who listen to his music flock to. He has broken a lot of records with his tours and all these things. He's doing great things. But my issue is that it was not as big of a cultural shake as Renaissance was. He's right. doing great things. It is not album of the year. It's not. And Beyonce is a perf. She, the whole thing though is Beyonce hasn't even gone on tour yet for Renaissance. But we right. already know from everything that we've seen, but the transitions in Renaissance the How vocal quality, vocal nobody vocal. is matching. Nobody is matching. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And the thing with a lot of, again, mm -hmm. we need to define album of the year. Is Beyonce, all of the vocal techniques, that is her. Mm -hmm. Like when you go and you look up who is the vocal engineer, mm -hmm. that's Beyonce knows. So anything vocally, that is her, which listen to the backing vocals, listen to the main vocals, listen to the ad libs, listen to everything. It's a masterpiece. Yeah. And that it to me, just because you can sit down with a piano and, and it's acoustic, that's nice too. But also that's not album of the year. Also album of the year to me should, if we, why do we have critics? Because even the critics rated Renaissance higher <laughs> than Harry. Um, I think so. I'm going to just read from Metacritic, which is, we, we know is one of the bigger, the bigger ones uh, rated Beyonce's Renaissance 91 out of 100. Uh, and they rated Harry's uh, an 83 out of 100. Um, let's see. Let's go with some other. Pitchfork gave uh, Renaissance a 9.0. Pitchfork gave Harry a 7.2. Rolling Stone, which is something, you know, has been part of mainstream media for, hell, uh, almost a century, you know, gave Beyonce five stars, gave Harry's house four stars. So it, it's all around, critically, Renaissance was the better production album. So, so then, what is what is album of the year? There's a gap. I think the the recording academy, whatever the whatever they want to call themselves, um, is not 
in line with what is actually the general what the general population uh feels and then that's that's my whole thing though about people putting themselves in positions where they're saying we're telling you what we ah cut it um, no you're not about to sit here and tell me what good music is i know i know what good music is and you just saying like do and that's my issue is they're saying well it's just what we know because you have positioned yourself as being the top 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 icon the, the pillar of what great music is you, everyone if you're an artist a musician you want a grammy like you want a right. grammy or if you don't you're calling it out like the weekend is a great artist who has has a, have a lot of grammy snubs and everything but and he, Nicki minaj Nicki minaj is okay. another artist Nicki minaj go through her whole career with not one single grammy when and that is that right she has shaped the pillar of hip-hop and rap was, she showed how much of a queen she still is when she re released a version of mixtape slash stuff she's recorded new and old and it they got more downloads than any other female rapper at the time like but again she showed right then and there i'm still the queen of this and i have retired Grammys need to be adjusted. And I did hear, this might be just a rumor, but I did hear that some of the people that were, you know, judging of the album of the year, one of the critiques was made was, Beyonce already has too many Grammys. Yes, yes. That was, that was I kept seeing that. Oh, she just, she has enough. Or she has oh, too many already. She would decide when she has enough. That's when she'll stop making music. Continue. Well, but why is it only like why why though? Because if it were some of their other favorite artists or for the Oscars, their other favorite actors who've been awarded all this other stuff all this many times, they but oh, it's because they deserve it. Why doesn't Beyonce deserve it? Right. Also, if your only beef is that she has enough already, then tell the like. Yeah. No. I know I'm why. Sorry. And the pff, girl. <laughs> See, I'm sorry. The, like the the my like Renaissance was a truly amazing album. It I'm was sorry. a masterpiece. It, it is a masterpiece. A work of art. art. It just wait flowed. Up, wait, until flow. wait until I see it in person. I swear to God, I I'm falling out. I'm waking up. I'm getting revived, and I, I, I I'm literally going to be with the stars because renaissance drop and, and let me just say and this is from beef I, I remember when beyonce says she is releasing an album of like disco this and that and i was like i don't that's a and that's a departure one thing like both the academy for the oscars as well as the recording academy mm -hmm. they love to see when artists kind of departure from what they're known and do something different exactly what the hell was this this is not what Beyonce have, has been putting out since her inception. It is a, a departure from what she is. This is not heavily hip hop. It, it has R&B flares, but it's also not that too. So it's a departure from what she is known for. And she did it successfully. And you mean to tell me- More than successfully. <laughs> that was-, that was We're not way. going to reward that, but let another artist- mm. Go, oh, let me, let me, um, uh, uh, let me, uh, make a R&B album when all I've been doing is pop. Watch me win a, a Grammy. I'm sick because I know it would win too. You know the the baby, baby, baby. You know he sings the baby song. Girl. Mm -hmm. Baby, baby, ooh, baby, baby, baby. Let me shout out before, before, before the people get down here. Oh, oh. So again, a departure from your normal so, sporting. I'm so, I'm so stupid. I'm so stupid. Yeah, that's crazy. But anyways. Yeah, I feel like that's enough. It's enough. I, I'm tired. I'm I'm tired because Beyonce is the most awarded artist in Grammy history. Period, mm -hmm. and she has earned every. She's earned more than what she was given. Mm. Right, and the fact that she is a mother, she's doing all these other philanthropic things, but she is also 
like still at the peak, the peak of what she is doing. And it does not seem like she is letting up at any point. I'm just, I really, really, truly hope, because she is an icon, but I think about it, I think about not winning that and her, like going back, you know, backstage or going back the first time she got to breathe after no one was around. I hope that she didn't get discouraged. I hope that she does not get discouraged because she's so deserving of so much. And I hate to see when artists who actually have shake, shook culture and have given people, like so many people, something that they needed and to not be affirmed about that. Yeah. Yeah. So it just sucks to see. From a, from a very humanistic standpoint, I was like, I hope Beyonce is okay. Yeah. Truly. And that, and that happened twice now to her. Uh-huh. Like, I have to my well, well, more well, she's, well more it's more. happened more than twice, to my knowledge. Like, me watching it, like, the, but the, the, I will say this, the funny part, the kind of funny part was the only person who was standing when she got that, when uh, he got that award. Around those tables of everybody else, the one person who up and clapped. Uh huh. I think she felt triggered. Well, I mean, the whole thing is like people clap for Harry, but Liz Adele's face. Adele was confused. I mean, here's the whole thing: they're amazing artists all in this room. Oh yes, no, they're going to be surprised. But the 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 uproar when Beyonce got the Grammy that set her over for best artist should have showed enough to know that even among her peers she stands out. Well, she I, stands. I, out. It came out very like then during Grammys is. It's so funny how you know everyone is winning awards that Grammy night. I was like Beyonce, you. I snuck out of school to go see you. And like all talking about her. This is all, all giving generation. Her the artists nowadays are all generation that Beyonce has influenced. Yes. And the fact that the Grammys have slighted her mm-hmm. in that big award, because uh, one thing people love to bring up is that Beyonce technically has only won one mm-hmm. of the big categories yeah, yeah. of the Grammys, which is album That's of the, the year, category. song of the year, record of the year. Right. And she won which one? She won. It was Song of the Year, or Record of the Year, and that was for uh, back in two thousand nine, maybe with uh, Single Ladies. Oh, it was Single Ladies. Yeah, and it was a long time ago, and she won it for that. And that was the only thing since then. And I'm just like, you know, Lemonade was such a, a, a dynamic album. And Renaissance topped that. Mm. Um, oh, Lemonade was my jam when it came out. Like I was a Beyonce fan, but I want listen to everything of that like Lemonade over and over. I I got on the Renaissance kick because every time me and Anthony got into the car in the fall semester, it was playing. So I was like, oh, and then I was like, what song is this? Is the same song? No, we're three songs later. Oh. Cause it was just, it was seamless. It was beautiful. Like I was mad, like, but Adele's face, Adele was like, are you kidding me? Are you literally kidding me? They know who should have won. Everyone knows who should have won. It's going to forever go down as one of those things that everyone knows what should have happened. But here we are. All that to say, shout out Beyonce. We love you. Shout out Bye. to Beyonce. I love you. All the podcasts. <laughs> Great time podcast. Um, but no, we hope you all enjoyed uh, uh, this. I'm sure everyone had their own little reactions to to Grammys. And um, there were a lot of awesome things that did happen, like yes. awesome wins and nominations that did happen. But, um, you know, we got to call it out when we see True. Injustice. So that's what we do. And on that note, um, we look forward to maybe seeing some of y'all at CBDNA uh, this upcoming week. And yes. um, we'll share the recording from that next week. So thanks for being here. Drop comments as always. And we'll see you next time. Bye. Uh, bye.